Now, next up is Bridget Smith, and Bridget Smith photographs interiors that mean a lot to the people who inhabit them and say a lot about them, often quite unintentionally. She's a sort of what you would call a fine art photographer who's fascinated by the way we make our own interiors and the way they make us, and how interiors can be sort of therapeutic and transformative as sort of refuges and stages for people's parallel lives, they, their real lives, as opposed to the lives they live in their homes and work. She's going to talk about some of the interior photographs in her absolutely wonderful book, Society, which is about societies of various kinds. Bridget. Thank you, Peter. Um, OK, so that's my um, interior that I chose. It's from Big Bieber, which um, around from 1974, which was um, I remember visiting as a, as a child and being overwhelmed by this absolutely amazing space and the ambition of that interior. Um, so today, um, what I'd like to say, so, so as an artist, I'm interested in the places where people go to seek refuge from the outside world, to escape boredom, to be diverted, transported, absorbed. Places to lose oneself where pretense and reality and some t uh, are sometimes confused. I put this down to a childhood growing up in a seaside town where amusements and being diverted, mainly from the rather magnificent view of the Thames estuary, were big on the cultural landscape. I go to sites that try to prompt and sometimes dictate a specific imaginative response in the participant. These photographs of the interiors of cinemas began when I was working as an usherette and found myself frequently alone in this beautifully eerie and compelling interior that I'd only ever previously experienced as part of a mass audience. It was almost as if I saw it for the first time, the grandeur of it and the way it had been designed to seduce and transport me held me in its thrall. The artificial landscapes of these interiors were a sublime stand-in for awe-inspiring nature. So when I started to photograph, when I started to photograph these otherworldly interiors, I did so devoid of all people, as I wanted the communion between the viewer and interior to be absolute in the artwork. I wanted to step outside of the social experience and, uh, and observe the construction and presentation of these interiors. The act of photographing them places them under an unusual amount of, sc of scrutiny. Each element takes on a new symbolism. The empty screen, the flipboard, the lectern, the seats for imparting and receiving views, set up for debate, places of collective experience with the activity not represented but having to become an imaginative act for the viewer. As an artist, all the spaces I photograph, whether they are interior or exterior, are about an imaginative space, more a state of mind or reverie than, say, a photograph about football. I enjoy emphasizing and playing with the elements of design that go into the construction of a space. There are rarely any views out of the interiors I photograph. They are enclosed worlds to which the external world is irrelevant. Bingo halls housed in former cinemas looking at the regimentation and structure of mass leisure time. Bingo halls operating in very much the same way as casinos, hoping to keep the participant occupied or preoccupied for as long as possible. I view all these interiors in a portrait-like way and take delight in finding a strange prop like the one here on the balcony for the corner of the house, almost as if I'd captured something revealing in a portrait, a spark of idiosyncrasy in an otherwise corporate landscape. A betting shop at the end of the day with its discarded worthless betting slips left abandoned on the floor. The disappointment of its punters mirrored by the interior. I'm interested in the role props and signs play within an interior. A community hall with a small sign letting the viewer imagine what posturing and posing occurred on the raised platform or within the yellow circle. The curtain mirroring the painted arm gestures the photograph affirming, as photographs do, that this is in the past. It has happened, and we, as visual archaeologists, are left to ponder its meaning or significance. I became interested in the kinds of spaces that people go to as refuge from the harsh realities of city life that are absolutely not dependent on grand architecture, corporate concerns, and big money. 
spaces that connect us to one another and to our sense of community rather than alienate us from each other. So this project became a book which was instigated and encouraged by curator Claire Cumberledge. It's called Society and was published by Steidl Mac and General Public Agency in 2007. The intention was to document a wide variety of clubs and societies in London, social, sporting, political, hobbyist, on the condition that they were formal societies that you had to be a member of and had to have a permanent dedicated space a portrait of the things people do, what they care about, and what they wish for. This is a photograph of the Southwark Sea Cadets, a rare example of a club whose interior <coughs> excuse me, promotes the idea of being elsewhere. The architecture and interiors are often workaday, perfunctory, and sometimes barely adequate. But what defines the spirit of these clubs is the often curious and diverse objects within, the quotidian clutter of life clubs often acting as homes away from homes. The informal, shaped by the members, made formal by the photographic image, private places of public display made public by the camera. Glimpses of humanity and joyfulness amidst municipal interiors. Apologies to William Morris. The spaces and the objects are part of a narrative and the images build on one another as you move through the book, making visual links and connections between disparate groups. A portrait of a city that has to be open to newcomers and is obliged to hold together difference, images that are optimistically held alongside one another within the structure of the book. As Sukhdev Sandhu writes in his essay, these clubs, even though they may be peopled by men and women of a particular race, age or ethnicity, often share design features. Pocked notice boards, national flags, shimmer curtains and mirror balls that evoke stage sets for future debates, but also a provisional and tentative unity underpinning seemingly unconnected organisations. The activity that is most important to these clubs has been left undocumented the sociability and the interaction amongst friends and fellow members. These spaces are photographed as if they were stage sets, seemingly objective in viewpoint. The images are highly artificial. We, the viewers, are left to imaginatively animate the image. These spaces are not meant to be unpeopled. The unconscious design in most of them appears conscious once made into an image and heightens the sense of decoration as symbolic and fixed. The artificiality of fixing a grouping that is in flux. Flyers will change, flags will come down, new paintings added, spaces refurbished. But the photograph will inevitably locate and fix it in time according to the sense that these are places of the past, not the future. Here, history is worn as a badge of honor. Yet as Claire Cumberledge has written, the photographs are a celebration of the unlikely, the unheralded, and the unspectacular a document of a social and cultural infrastructure that is both fragile and resilient. Resilient, certainly against drab, anonymous interiors. Color used as part of a philosophy of well-being and inner peace. As a photographer, I'm interested in the situations where somebody has created a space that has its own sense of how the world can be resolved. The act of photographing is a duplication of their act of creating a setting. The camera represents people with the idea of those situations. But as Diane Arbus often said about her subjects, you always notice the flaw. The flaw or awkwardness in the photograph is often what gives it its interest and gets under our skin in the way that more perfect, a more perfect environment does not. Arbus again. I work from awkwardness. By that I mean I don't like to arrange things. If I stand in front of something, instead of arranging it, I arrange myself. The emotional, Im the emotional attachment to each interior was felt and very particularly voiced by Stephen McNeely of the Swedenborg Society, who said, for myself, the architecture of my thinking is conditioned by the meterage of the floor space, which is a very Swedenborgian way of thinking that place is entirely constructed by emotional states and that place is a manifestation of you. There is a sense of the congregation and the audience, as much as a sense of activity and participation. Debates and questioning of our place in this city, this world, and the wider universe. 
secular churches with their traditions and icons, retreats and respite from the outside world. This image is of, is of the Latin American Golden Years Club. It is housed in a drab building in an anonymous corner of Camberwell, barely noticeable from the street and with an entrance that is concerned more with security than a sense of welcome. Yet inside the club is a colorful, supportive environment that gives people who have long been estranged from their homelands a place to reminisce, to learn new skills, and to enjoy life. At the center of the photograph is a painting that the members have made together. It is a utopian vision. The best aspects from each person's country have been combined to create a new idealized landscape. The painting is itself framed by a theatrical curtain, but is otherwise part of the general melee. As a painting, it is a collective act of imagination. As a photograph, the interior is spatially hard to unpick and heightens our sense of confusion as to the distinction between what is real and what is representation, and which should take precedence. But more importantly, it depicts the imaginary and the idealistic clearly placed within the heart of the everyday. I would just like to read um, a proposal written to the Guggenheim in 1963 by Diane Arbus for her photographic project, which she called American Rights, Manners and Customs, and which resonates with this project. I want to photograph the considerable ceremonies of our present, because we tend, while living here and now, to perceive only what is random and barren and formless about it. While we regret that the present is not like the past, and despair of it ever becoming the future, its innumerable, inscrutable habits lie in wait for their meaning. I want to gather them like somebody's grandmother, putting up preserves because they will have been so beautiful. There are the ceremonies of celebration, the pageants, the festivals, the feasts, the conventions, and the ceremonies of competition, contests, games, sports. The ceremonies of buying and selling, of gambling, of the law and the show the ceremonies of fame in which the winners win and the lucky are chosen, or family ceremonies of, or gatherings, the schools, the clubs, the meetings. Then there, the, then there are the ceremonial places, the beauty parlor, the funeral parlor, or simply the parlor, and ceremonial costumes, what waitresses wear or wrestlers, ceremonies of the rich, like the dog show, and of the middle class, like the bridge game. Or, for example, the dancing lesson, the graduation, the testimonial dinner, the seance, the gymnasium, and the, picture, and the picnic. And perhaps the waiting room, the factory, the masquerade, the rehearsal, the initiation, the hotel lobby, and the birthday party. The etc. These are our symptoms and our monuments. I want simply to save them, for what is ceremonious and curious and commonplace will become legendary. Legendary. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm just gonna...